This is M Shadows and you're watching Loudwire. Hey everyone, Graham from Loudwire here and it's Wikipedia Fact or Fiction time. An episode you've been asking for for a long time. M Shadows, thank you so much up, man? man. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. No worries. So, this very day, I went on to Avenged Sevenfold's Wikipedia, your Wikipedia, albums, songs, all that stuff. Pulled out some things. You can tell me if it's fact or fiction. Okay. All right. So first off, uh, Matthew Charles Sanders, born in Huntington Beach, California. I was born somewhere else. Ah. They do get that wrong a lot of the time. So where was it? I was born in Fountain Valley. From, That's also in California. For my uh, recollection, that was okay. Uh, it was uh, Fountain Valley is from. Uh, I think that's what it says on my birth certificate. Okay, so we'll we'll trust it's the birth next, certificate. It's the city next door. Okay, well, fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit of fiction. We always gotta check that. Uh, it says that you began singing at an early age, but your interest in rock and heavy metal music really grew as you learned to play the guitar. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. uh, I mean, it's like a nuanced. Uh, nuanced uh, little statement there, I guess, because okay. it's like, who really knows, right? I, I, mm. I, I was into Guns N' Roses, or I was into Guns N' Roses, my dad gave me the first tape, and I was into rock music, and then I wanted to purchase a guitar, and obviously got more and more into it, so I guess it's true. Okay, so the interest in rock was when you were singing, but then it, that kind of pushed you into guitar. I was definitely not singing, I was just listening. You weren't even I was singing just listening. back then? No, I was okay. not singing. I didn't want to be a singer, man, I got forced into it. <laughs> <laughs> when did you start singing, then? We started a punk band, and we were just like I, I, I played piano, and I, I had I you know I don't have perfect pitch where I can tell you what notes are being played, but I can always sing yeah. whatever notes being played, and I can figure out my way around what's going on. And, um, so I guess I had a natural ear for it. Mm -hmm. So you become the singer when you're, you know, in high school or grade school, and people are starting bands. So you're like. Oh. I guess I got to sing. I'm the only one that can sing in key. <laughs> All right. So I guess you didn't start singing at a very young age, no. like, like it's said in here. No. So, okay, there's some fiction. Uh, Wikipedia says that you can play the clarinet. <laughs> no. <laughs> I wish that was true. Nice. Okay. Thought that may have been true maybe in the, uh, the high school uh, band. Or oh, that's the, great. Whatever. I love that. Uh, can, we exactly. just make, can we just make that true? If you I'd want be it so to be. much cooler if I could play the clarinet. It'd be pretty good. That's, those reads are difficult, though. I'm telling you, dude, I tell everyone this. They go, like, what instrument should I play? What, what am I going to want to play on while I say anything? And think about going to a dinner party, you're 30 years old, and someone just picks up the clarinet and just slays on it. It's cool. Uh, Wikipedia cites Guns N' Roses as your biggest influence, and it says that Slash was one of the inspirations for Avenged Sevenfold coming up with stage names. That's true. That's all true. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when you were a kid, seeing the name Slash, I guess you'd be like, oh, that's so cool. I got to have my own slash. Was it a bit like that? A little bit, but it was more like we were part of a hardcore scene that was very judgmental, and we knew that it would piss people mm. off if we had stage names, and we loved oh, really? pissing people off. So we, and Guns N' Roses is one of the big boy bands that, yeah. you know, they were just above all that. We're like, we're going to make some fake names, and we're just going to stick it out with them. And yeah. then now you have a bunch of 36-year-old men with stage names. <laughs> Which did is going to be even worse when we're 80. <laughs> did you succeed in pissing off the hardcore oh, kids yeah. with the stage names? Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. They're, oh, not, yeah, they're not hard good. to piss off. You guys formed in 99, along with Zachy Vengeance, The Rev, and Matt Went, all of whom you knew from middle school. Yep. That's all true. That's true. Tell me about Matt Went. I, don't, I feel like I know nothing about him or anything about him. So Matt Went was a, a, a good friend of ours that was into all the punk rock we were into and all the bands. and. He's just one of our best friends, played sports with him, played mm -hmm. music with him growing up. And then, you know, at some point, he decided that he was going to go to college. We actually saw Matt Went a couple months ago uh, on our last tour. He came out to the uh, San Francisco show with his Damn. wife. And he's awesome. He's got his family, and he's, got, he's doing politics, and he's doing his really? thing. And hmm. he's, uh, it's, it's awesome. It was good to see him. Oh, that's cool. I guess it worked out for him. Huh? Yeah. That's cool. Uh, it says that sounding the seventh trumpet was recorded for just two thousand dollars, and the Rev recorded all his drums in just one take. That's true. Wow, all true. So, uh, I guess that's the first time that you did a true recording uh, with the Rev. Obviously, you knew how talented he was. Were you still blown away that he was able to do it all in one take? No, because we just knew Jimmy. It's just, just yeah. him. It's just like it's him. It's like 
And he was, by the end, there was like mistakes and he just wouldn't redo them because he was going to ruin his one take. And oh, so, man. So he really wanted to be that one take guy. Yeah, and as you hear the record progress, because a lot of the songs that were on the end of the record were recorded later, mm -hmm. uh, and you could just see it get sloppier and sloppier. <laughs> and and it, was, it was awesome. It was fun. He just, yeah. no click track, obviously. It was just all over the place. He just played. And nice. he just wanted to do it one take, and he went around town telling everyone one take. It said that you decided that you didn't want to scream anymore shortly after finishing sounding of the seventh trumpet. Uh, of course, Waking the Fallen was a bit of screaming, so is that true or not? It's sort of true. I mean, I, I don't remember exactly how the process went, but I just felt some of the songs on Waking the Fallen could have... I remember at the time wanting to have more and more vocals, and I remember mm. that was a key part of the songwriting. And a lot of times, it's so easy to write... I mean, it's going to sound bad, but this is, it's so much easier to write riffs and just scream over them. Um, when you have to come up with a vocal melody and the chord progressions yeah. have to work and the vocal melody has to be interesting, it's so much more challenging. But it's also, to me, a lot more fulfilling once you nail that. And as we were getting bigger, I just kept finding myself being more and more attracted to European power metal that was singing, like mm. the Blind Guardians and the sure. Sonata Arcticas. And I was finding myself drift further away from just the pure screaming, even though I like the riffage. Um, so on Waking the Fallen, you know, we, I was, we were just, when we had good vocal parts, we just put them in, and when we couldn't think of anything, we'd scream. <laughs> and then on the next record, we said, we're done with that, we're just going to go and just put our work in and just really do the vocals on this one and, and sing. So I think by City of Evil, we had a plan, but it was just a very natural progression that we were just unhappy screaming. Warmness on the soul. You're credited as Shadows and Sinister Gates, as credited as Sinister Gates, G-A-Y-T-E-S. And it says on Wikipedia that it's because the stage names were not completely final at the time. So Sinister Gates definitely wanted his name spelled G-A-Y-T-E-S. And then once very he good. saw it in print, <laughs> he said, I'm changing it to G-A-T-E-S. Okay, uh, so he was obviously aware of the gay and yeah. like was, thought it was funny that. at he the time. Was funny. And then yeah. it wasn't so funny anymore. So and he, then he so sees he it in print and he's like, mm, yeah, we're gonna okay, change Gates. That. Yeah. Uh, it says a little piece of heaven was inspired by Broadway show tunes and an animated video was made for the song, but due to the song's controversial subject matter, Warner Brothers only released it to registered MVI users on the internet. Yeah, I don't know. It's all over the internet now, so I don't know what the deal is with it. Um, yeah. I do know that the song just came straight out of Jimmy's brain. I, I don't know if it was inspired yeah. by anything other than, like, Oingo Boingo. You know, it was very <laughs> Danny Elfman-inspired. Oh, um, sure. And so, I don't know if show tunes is the right term, but I think the, the press kind of put that word out there after it came out. But really, it was just, we were going to do a, a Halloween EP, um, and that was one of the songs that was going to be on it. And okay. when we played it for the label... Um, when we handed the record in, we had these extra songs, and they came to us and said, why is this not on the record? And we said, because it's like a crazy, and they're like, you guys are insane if you don't put this on the record. And we're like, fine, we'll put it on the record. I, that was probably a good call by them. Frankly. Well, you know what it was? I think a lot of it had to do with, it, it was going to scrap our EP idea, and we were really butthurt about oh, that. Oh, really? Like, no, we need our Halloween EP. Yeah. Hey, if I had a Halloween EP, it was cool. You know, so uh, we, we got that scrapped, and uh, the label made a good call there and said, this is really cool. Wow. Awesome. We didn't think they would get it. That's no. why, you know what I mean? Like, we thought we were going to hand that in there and be like, what are you guys thinking? Uh, it says uh, the single Nightmare was digitally released on May 18th, 2010. A preview for the song was released on May 6th on Amazon, but was removed soon after for unknown reasons. Uh, I remember that. We were in Mexico, and I remember all of a sudden we have this all this hype for a new record, and there it is, leaked on Amazon. Leaked. They totally messed it up. Mm. Uh, we weren't able to do our plan, yeah. and they just jumped the gun, and I don't know if it was a, a mistake, a digital mistake, or if it was just purely someone that wanted to jump, jump the gun on it, yeah. but we were f in Mex all of us were in Mexico, hanging out, and we were flipping out. We're yeah, like, you were pissed. Ah. Yeah, we were mm. so bummed, because we wanted it to be released the way we wanted it to be of released. Of course. And uh, since then, I think we've really uh, chilled out on that kind of stuff. Mm. It is what it is. It's the internet. It's going to be out there eventually, and it's going to be free eventually. So, But at the time, it was kind of a new 
thing like, wow, they got us. They, they put this out before we wanted it out. Yeah, I guess back then leaking wasn't quite as common. Yeah. Now it's like, it's just gonna yeah. happen, right? It is what it is. Yeah. Unless you surprise release a record. Then it doesn't Exactly, leak. then you <laughs> leak it yourself. Yeah. yeah? Uh, last one for you. It says the stage is Avenged Sevenfold's first concept album, uh, but Nightmare was planned to be a concept record, but the plans were scrapped following the Rev's passing. Okay, so we were throwing around the idea of doing Nightmare as a concept album. Right. But I don't even consider the stage a concept album. I think it's conceptual. Really? Okay. I mean, it's conceptual with, you know, the ideas that all kind of piece it together, but there's no story, there's no guy or, you know, and I, I feel like there's, there's really no, like, character, and this is just the human race, and it's about things that can all fit together between artificial intelligence, space exploration, et cetera, et cetera. But I feel like it's conceptual in its, in, in its pieces, but I don't feel like this is a concept album. Okay. Per se. Gotcha. Well, was Nightmare ever supposed to be a, like a legit concept album? It's such early workings. I mean, the first song Nightmare was going to start it off, this guy in okay. a dream and wakes up and who knows, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's where it was going. Um, but then when something happens, you know, in your life, that, that, you know. Changes what you're tragic. going to be inspired by. Exactly. Frank. So that's yeah. almost a concept album, the same as the stages. It's all based around yeah. at that point. So I think they're, they're two conceptual records, but I would not say a concept album. Fair enough. Dude, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, I man. appreciate it. Go get the stage if you haven't gotten it yet. The deluxe edition and also live at the Grammy Museum acoustic record. M Shadows, everybody.